All right, guys, we have an awesome guest today. I'm joined by Tyler Rucker of No Ceilings NBA. He's just a fantastic draft just guru. I'm excited to have you on, Tyler. Do you mind? Uh, well, first off, welcome. Thank and, you. And uh, do you mind just telling everyone who you are and what you do and and every where they can follow you? Yeah, uh, on, on Twitter, I'm at Tyler underscore Rucker. So um, I'm part of the No Ceilings NBA team. And what we do is cover the draft year round, try to give uh, you know spotlight to all the prospects, not just the, the big guys that might be going in the lottery, but we try to spotlight even you know, guys that might be undrafted looking at two-way contracts or, or going late in the second round. We, we try to make sure that everyone gets the, the proper spotlight and attention. So it's been a, what, this is our third year. It's been a great grind. Um, we love doing what we do and the public response has been fantastic. So, you know, that's, it's free, free content delivered into your uh, mailbox every day. So we, we try to cover a prospect or draft analysis or NBA coverage uh, year round. Well, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little jealous of you guys because the draft is one of my favorite things. I mean, I cover the jazz, you know, day to day with SLC dunk, but I just, something about the draft is so fun looking at these guys kind of wondering who's going to translate. Who's, who's not seeing them young and seeing how they develop. It's all to me, it's fascinating. So I, and if you guys don't follow no ceilings, you're missing out because they do great stuff. I feel like I feel like it's some of the best out there, honestly, you know, and you guys, if you're not following them and Tyler and all that, their team there, you're missing out. So anyways, I'm excited to have Tyler on. I wanted to talk about specifically the jazz, but some of the top 10 prospects in the NBA and then maybe some late first ones. And then also I, I have to hear from you guys, from you, Tyler, about um, Cooper flag and Ace Bailey and all these guys and, and your thoughts on them and what you've seen. Cause I believe you guys were at hoop summit. And weren't you at some of the other venues? I know there was the Vegas showcase. I don't know if you guys were there. Um, yeah, we, we have a, uh, that's kind of the cool thing about our, our team is everyone's kind of stationed all across the country. And that's kind of something we targeted trying to to get when we started this out because we're, we're grinding to make this a business and be a full-time thing. And it, it is a full-time thing for us, but a lot of us have, you know, full-time jobs on the side. So it's definitely being a, a battle, but yeah, we were, Nike Hoop Summit, um, a lot of our guys have been at a lot of these events getting ready for next year as well, but we're also, you know, it's it's that time of the year where we're really grinding to get ready for pre-draft workouts, the combine, a lot of buzz, getting the mocks and big boards updated, so it, it's an exciting time of the year. It's it's definitely chaotic. Well, I'm excited. So anyways, let's see. Uh, the Utah Jazz, you know, when they went into the season, I thought they were going to try to convey that pick because there's some things with how their draft picks convey that they wouldn't get a pick in 2026 if they don't convey their pick over the next two years. So I think the writing is on the wall that Utah is probably going to try to be kind of bottom 10. I, I know Danny Ainge said some things recently about uh, Danny. Say, Danny Ainge says a lot of things. And then a lot of times what actually happens is different. So I, I think the Jazz are definitely going to be in on Cooper flag and them next year. But we'll talk about this year first. Mm -hmm. And I think. I, you know, I know that this draft, just following other drafts, there's not really this this guy at the top, like a Zion Williamson or someone like that, who's like the clear cut number one. But there are some really interesting prospects um, in the top 10. And there's a few guys I wanted to ask you about. I guess, you know, if Utah wins the lottery, let's say they win the number one. Who is your number one in this draft and why? It's a diff it's a difficult year. Um, it's definitely, but for us, it's exciting because it's brought forth a lot of debate the whole year and kind of talking to scouts, talking to person around around the league, and you're like, hey, who do you like? Usually, each year you kind of get the same vibes, the same responses. This year, it's whoever you talk to, you get a different response. Um, I think the the upside swing this year, if you get the number one pick, is going to be Alexander Saar. Uh, he's been. The last couple of years, he was with the OTE, 7'1", 215-ish pounds, um, really talented defender that can can move around, and that's his NBA skill is going to be the the defensive versatility. Um, he's been with the NBL this year, you know, played overseas, had some really good flashes, but the stats aren't going to wow you for a potential number one pick. It, he's just the high upside. If everything kind of falls into place, you could get something special. Um, so I, I think Sar would be, you know, he's number one on my board. He's number one on a lot of people's boards, but a lot of people aren't overly excited about it. But it it makes sense when you have a player that size with the defensive potential 
and how fluid he moves on the court. You know, if the offense kind of develops and you can be patient, it's a really good piece to have um, with his positional versatility. Yeah, I mean, Utah had easily one of the worst defenses in the league this year. Um, One of the bright sides for Utah, though, was Taylor Hendricks and Mm -hmm. how he could kind of a similar type of player. He's not as big as Sar, at least as tall and long, but he's pretty long. And what was exciting was that you could see that Taylor Hendricks, once he was on the floor and getting regular minutes, he could switch and guard lots of different positions. And I is Sar someone like that, that if you get him on the floor next to like a Taylor Hendricks, could they both be kind of switchable defenders to, together? Do you think yeah. that would be a possibility? Absolutely. And, 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 you know, you hinted about Danny Ainge. I grew up a, a diehard Boston Celtics fan, so I'm very familiar with Danny Ainge's <laughs> philosophy in the front office. And I thought Utah had a fantastic draft last year when it came to just getting these pieces that you can be patient with. And Danny's really, really good. He's one of my favorites about being patient, giving these guys plenty of time to develop confidence and and not panicking, you know, about like, oh, a tough rookie year. He had Jalen Brown and he was very patient. And look at Jalen Brown now. So Taylor, you know, is one of those players. I think everyone always gets excited when you get a new shiny rookie that's a top 10 pick. And some of these times, these guys just take time. Like he was, he had a fantastic um, college season and really made noise up boards. But you pair him, you know, and I think he's going to be having a big step next year. But you pair him with someone oh, yeah. like Alex Saar, you're really having size, ver- defensive versatility, shot blocking. Like that's something you can get excited about building for the future. And all of a sudden you're getting guys like Keontae and Bryce sensible around that are the offensive minded. It's a good little recipe to kind of roll with. So yeah, I, I think Utah's in a great spot this year because as everyone's going to keep downplaying this draft, they're going to keep saying it's, it's a bad draft. I understand because you're picking in the top five, you could have some questions, but your team like Utah who could have multiple picks, I think you could build a lot of depth in this draft. There's a lot of depth. There's a lot of intriguing rotation guys that can make your team better. Oh, for sure. I think it's one of those where you, you can, I can see a lot of these guys in the top 10 being NBA rotation players. And I know if you're in the top 10, you're kind of disappointed that right, oh, we, right. get a, we get a starter, but he's not probably going to make an all-star. I mean, I, I'm sure, I mean, every draft produces at least one to two all-stars. So there's going to be some guy in this draft and who knows? Maybe it's Sar. I know who I kind of <laughs> am hoping the Jazz. Get. Oh, I'm excited way, to I, hear this. I'm excited <laughs> to hear this, James. I, okay. Well, well, you guys hurt my feelings a little bit because you had him pretty high, and I'm really hoping he falls to eight. But I am in love with Stefan Castle. I think Castle is just, to me, he's honestly of the top ten. I think he's honestly one of the for sure guys that is going to be like a ten to fifteen year NBA player. I think he's gonna. I love. His, I mean, he's big there's something about him. Like when I'm watching players play, he looks like he's just strong. Like you can tell there's some guys on the court that are just strong and he's got that athleticism. It's funny. He moves with kind of, it's almost like he's extremely patient with his movements, but you can tell he's explosive. Um, And then just, you consider the defense. I, I could just gush about this guy, the defense, the unselfishness, the passing, you know, everyone talks about the shooting, but his form looks pretty good to me. It just will need time. And when you consider the work ethic and everything, it's he's a guy that I would bet on. What are your thoughts on Stefan Castle and how do we get him to Utah at eight? <laughs> Can you I knew this talk was badly gonna... about him on your, your website? No, I, I, I got him. I've got him at two. Um, uh, so I, see, I knew I, I knew I was going to like coming on this podcast. I knew it. I knew I was going to like you, James. You're a smart man already. He's <laughs> been one of my guys all year. Um, Going back to his high school film, I was just like, "Who this guy can play. And the the scary development is how big of a jump he took as a defender. You know, in the preseason, we kind of heard buzz at no ceilings about like, hey, Castle's really raising some eyes with his defense in, you know, practices for UConn. And we're like, okay, that's an interesting development. And then I think he was one of the best perimeter defenders in college basketball this year, maybe in this class. Um, you know, Ryan Dunn's in that conversation too, but Castle, 6'6", 215, he's listed at. He's tough. Um, I think everyone's obsessing. The the shot is a legit concern, but I, I'm in the camp of like, I'm buying it. He makes too many impactful plays. Like he just knows how to make an impact without having the ball in his hands all the time, whether it's on defense or making the extra pass, rebounding. Um, 
just smart, gritty player. Um, and, and I just am buying a guy that could, as a freshman, can accept, hey, my role is going to be lessened, but this team has a lot of pieces and we're going to win. Like, you know, um, they had an article and Dan Hurley was kind of talking about Castle and Castle's like, I just want to win whatever I need to do to win. Ah, like, yeah, I, I love that. I've never been a winner. I want to win. And, and I think, you know, a team like Utah, if they could get Castle, you put him with Keontae George and then you have a patient year of letting those guys get some run. And then what if you all of a sudden do land a Cooper flag? And that's your kind of like, whoo, you're really cooking with something. something so, yeah. So I, I, I love Castle. I, I think the everything I've heard is fantastic about him. I think the shot's going to come around. I think he's got the potential to be a star in this class. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was interesting about Utah, and and Taylor Hendricks got better at it as the season went on, even, especially, I mean, those last five, six games. And I know you're playing against teams not trying all that hard, but right. you saw the passing kind of improve. But I feel like sometimes people don't understand how valuable having players that both can defend on one end and handle and pass the ball on the other. Utah really struggled this year when, I mean, they went, they started the season three and seven and it was with, you know, Colin Sexton, who's a, who's a solid NBA player, but I wouldn't call him like an elite passer. And you had Larry Markkinen, not a great passer, Taylor Hendricks and all these, and you know, Walker Kessler, the jazz just didn't have a lot of playmaking on the floor and the offense struggled heavily. And I think sometimes people can just say, Oh, well his three point percentage is this. So he can't be a good NBA player. And I think, you know what? They would have won a lot more games if the jazz had a player like Stefan castle on the floor that can connect the dots a little bit. You're setting players up. Not, it's not just, I mean, shooting is important for sure. If Stefan castle becomes an elite shooter in the NBA, you're looking at an all-star because oh, he's sure. just awesome. But at worst, he's going to be a connecting player that defends and maybe he can be a Drew Holiday type player type thing. He's kind of someone I could see his ceiling kind of being. And yeah, Utah could. Un I mean, that would be such a home run for them. I, I've heard some rumblings and things. I, I mean, I think there's a world if Utah won number, the number one pick, I would not be surprised if they drafted Stefan Castle. I think they love that guy. And, you know, Danny Ainge, when he got that number one pick from Brooklyn, he traded back got Jason Tatum and I could see it. I mean, these are me just dreaming as a jazz fan, things that the jazz could possibly do. It's but, a, it's a, it's a big year to be open-minded. I think that's what, like, people might hear that at first and be like, what are you talking about? Everyone's projecting SAR. And it's like, no, no, no. Like when you ask around NBA teams are very open-minded this year, because that's why they're saying like, whatever the lottery tells us when, the, when the lottery passes, we're all going to be able to be like, okay, now here's some options. It's going to be like, finally we can try to fit the pieces of the puzzle together because right now there's, you could list five guys that could go first. Like, and I know I was talking about Sar earlier, but like there's teams that probably if they won that first pick, they might be like, it might take a while. Are we wanting to invest in that project? And I think Danny would be the type of guy that's like, Hey, I, I love this guy. And we got the number one pick. He might say, I'm going to go back to three and we're going to take Castle. And we love him. We'd take him at one, but we're going to let someone come up and take Sar. I, I just think Castle, I think you're spawn on. Like just a smart player that a lot of teams need. Like you, when you're rebuilding and jazz fans, don't jump on me. I'm just saying if you're rebuilding and you're trying to get back to where you were before, I think Castle's the one that instead of a baby step, you take a solid step forward because you just get that glue connecting guy that makes everybody else life a little bit easier. Like him and Keontae, woof, that, it's a fun duo just oh, because their, be. their strengths bounce off of each other. It'd be, it'd be awesome. It would be a lot of fun. Um, there's a few other guys I wanted to ask you about. So um, a lot of people have Modest Buscellis going to Utah at eight, which I think he might be available there. He was kind of, before the season started, a lot of people had him up top. Um, the G League Ignite had a very kind of, not a great year. I think they probably had too many young prospects on there without a lot of veteran players that could kind of, because a lot of times what happens is, and it's why teams play young players. It's why Utah went fully young is, you know, that you're not going to win a lot of games because you don't have veterans there that kind of lift that floor for a team. And so I don't know if we got the best look at Modest Buscellis this year, or at least when people kind of just do, because a lot of people out there just do box score watching. They're not actually watching the games. And like, what does this guy actually look like? So there's a few guys from that G League Ignite I want to ask you about that might be available for Utah at eight. 
Um, Modest Bucellus won, and then Ron Holland, who I'm kind of surprised he's falling as far as he has. Uh, what are your thoughts? Who would you take if those two are available for Utah? And and what are your thoughts on both of them based off of what you've seen? I think they're both, you know, it, it's tough with the Ignite because everyone, everyone always fascinated over the years of the Ignite's wins and losses record. They, they didn't care. Like they weren't trying to win the G League championship. They were trying to develop these players to get ready for the NBA. And you know, I, I'm not trying to sound so blunt when I'm like, oh, they don't care about winning. It's just they're not obsessed with that. And if they were, they would have been getting more vets. And this year was tough because they both came in, Holland and Bazellas came in with some lofty expectations. Like both were considered, hey, these might be top three guys. They they really got a shot. Bazellas is the interesting one. And and 6'10, um, little skinny, but he's added a lot of good weight. He he's been grinding on that. He shot like mid forties in high school from deep. So, and it looks like he has a good looking shot. And this year, everyone's expectation was like, Oh gosh, this six ten floor spacer with a little bit of upside. This could be fun. The shot just never came around when it came to percentages this year. Um, and it was kind of like, okay, so, so what are we working with here? And then, when you talk to people, a lot of personnel were a little like, eh, I'm cooling on Bazellus. Then he started really taking strides defensively, like playing off the ball, rim protecting. He took really good strides there. It, it impressed me. And I think he's created a little bit more momentum to get back up boards. He's going to be fascinating because it's, this year it only takes one team. One team just needs to, to fall in love with you. Um, I'm not surprised he's kind of slid a little bit, but I also think he's going to go to pre-draft workouts and look very, very good. You know, the notorious chair defender in those workouts when they're playing one on Oh, I, I think he'll look fantastic shooting the ball and, you know, he's got good mentality, good Intel. So he's going to be interesting. Um, Ron Holland has been a, 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 a headache for a lot of evaluators this year because People will look at the stats. You look at the highlight tapes. You're like, this is the top three guy. What are you, what are we doing here? Because he's a blur in transition. I mean, he really is dangerous. He's super fast. He can get downhill, finishes with anger above the rim. It's just the in-between game, I think, still a little raw. But I'm one of the guys I'm still buying on the upside. Um, I still have him in my top 10 easily. Um, I've kind of had him there all year. If Utah was at eight and loved the tools, I would get it. I would understand um, because he's not going to turn 19 until summer league play. He's got a lot of Man. potential. So Ron's just one of those. If you're going to be patient, the Intel checks out um, and you, bu you buy the, the tools developing. I, I, it makes a lot of sense. Like for someone like Utah it makes a ton of sense. If, if they're in on the run hall and, you know, I don't want to say project, but just being patient to let the best basketball come out. Um, there's another guy, and this may be a, a waste of a question, but... Never. Dink. No, there's no such thing with me. Come on. <laughs> well, Dink Pay is coming, yeah. is trying to get into this draft. And I, you know, obviously the numbers aren't great, but he's the youngest prospect, I think, of everybody. Um, and if you look at it, if you look at the 2025 mocks, he's slated to go top, top 10. And so I think this upcoming season was supposed to be the year that you really saw what he could do. Uh, if Dean Pate is allowed to enter this draft, is he someone the Jazz should look at taking at eight? Even though the numbers weren't great, you can see the the form there. You can see the athleticism. What are you? What are your thoughts on him? A lot of raw tools with his game. He is going to be one of the youngest guys. I would be shocked out of my mind if he got approved and, and it's a tough situation for those guys because when they announced they were kind of shutting down the ignite program, a lot of us at no ceilings were the first question was like, what's going on with Dink? Like what, what's his situation? Does he have to go try to play overseas? It, so we're kind of patiently waiting. And when that report came out that he's going to try to see, I was like, eh, good luck. You know, <laughs> I don't know if the NBA is going to bend the rules <laughs> for you, but we'll see. Um, it, you never know. Surprises could happen he was looking much better towards the kind of end of the season because I think they were just letting him play and get some experience. And he put up some big, big performances. So he's, he was that raw talent that you're like, Ooh, next year's going to be fun to keep an eye on him. And if all of a sudden something does happen and he does get approved, I think 
he'll be the name to watch. Now, I mean, that report came out and a lot of, you know, draft fans were like, oh, I'm putting him in my top five. I was like, guys, let's, let's pump the brakes. Let's wait a little <laughs> bit. But um, no, he'll, he would be a very interesting wild card. He would be someone that teams are probably obsessing to get him in for workouts to kind of get an evaluation because there's good size, there's good upside. And in this draft, if, if you're buying into his tools at that age, yeah, I could see him getting getting selected pretty early. But I, we got to be in wait wait and see mode to see if he officially is allowed to be in this class. Uh, I I kind of do. I kind of hope he does, just because it makes things more interesting. Honestly, right. more prospects in the draft make this draft better. Uh, let's see. I you know I don't know if I have as many questions about. It. Is there someone in the late first round that you think Utah should really be looking at? I'm looking at just some of the mocks right here of someone like Kai, Kaishan George, Deron Holmes. Is there anyone at Ryan Dunn? I I've heard lots of good things. Mm -hmm. If you're Utah at 29, who would you hope is kind of there and that you would take? I think Dunn would be a fun um, talent just because I think he might be one of the best defenders in this class. The offense needs some confidence, but I also think there could be a, an untapped, you know, talent there that like you could strike gold especially with how good his defense is um so that would be a really interesting one if he's on the board kaishan george is very talented um i would be shocked if he's on the board when they pick but you never know with danny Ainge in utah they might be trying to go up to get someone uh really raw but can shoot it from really deep he's fluid great size trying to think of some other names kevin mcculler could be a name that is uh, an interesting piece there just because he's kind of like the the versatility the defense kind of was banged up this year so i'm interested to see kind of his medicals and stuff but theron holmes is another one too i i, I think he's gonna have a lot of fans he had a great year he, he returned to dayton had another great year like kind of improved offensively with what he could do he'd be a fantastic get for the jazz so that's why I think teams like, you know, the Jazz and fans, you should be excited with the depth because you could get some really good pieces in this draft. You know, I think everyone's going to be like, well, it's not a top five pick. And it's like, this might be the year not to have a top five pick, but if you do get up there, you can get creative. So it's going to be a fun year. I, I, I understand why everyone's down on it, but I also am like, guys, it's still going to be a, an interesting draft to, to build some depth for your team. I tell you what, I would not be surprised if Utah traded up. I, I honestly, I love Savon Castle that much. And yeah, if Utah could move, if he's there at like three or four and you know you can go get him, I just think, you know what? And Utah has next year's Minnesota pick. I think Minnesota is going to be good next year. Why not give them yours? And I don't know. I just think there might be some movement on this one. Who knows? Or maybe they just stand still. But I, I man, I'm so big on Savon it's Castle. It's the It's the year to do it. I think a lot of teams up there might be a little like, eh, we don't love anyone. And if you're a team like Utah, we're like, we love a guy. We'll go, we'll go get him. Like we'll take advantage of this. Like I, I think it could be a lot of navigating, but it also could be a lot of navigating in which teams are like, we're not paying top dollar for that pick for you to get out of there, but we'll, we'll make a deal. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. Who are some guys that are kind of in this top 10 range that you're like, why is that guy there? Or what am I missing? Oh, you're really throwing me uh, um, some spotlight right now. Uh... <laughs> like, I, I'll tell you mine. I'm not quite huh. sure I get it with Reed Shepard. I don't really. I mean, I, you know, he can shoot. I just, just as someone who covers the NBA, I just can't see Reed Shepard being successful in the NBA if he's anything other than a point guard. Mm -hmm. And you know, he's about that same size as Keontae George, but Keontae has this kind of special offensive upside. I, am I wrong on him or, you know, I don't know. Is there anyone outside of Reed Shepard that, you know, and maybe you're completely disagree. I don't know. No, 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 no. I, I reads the, he, reads the wild card because depends on who you ask. You know, it, it, some people love him. Some people are like, I don't know. Some people think he could be a stud point guard. Some guys are just like, he's a good combo guard. I think what you're thinking with Reed is he's the type of guy that every team that's trying to get to the playoffs every year and just be in the playoffs, you're trying to contend. 
you need that guy that's just like, oh, he just knows how to play. He's always delivering. And I know everyone will joke and be like, his last college game wasn't the best. You know, I, I keep joking. It was his exit interview was very poor. But I think Reed is like smart shooter, smart player, understands how to play alongside other talent. He's going to make people better. Um, he can really shoot. And I also think he understands how to get to his spots and not force the issue too much. So he's going to be one of those guys where I think some teams just might be head over heels and be like, this is, yes, we love him. We just love the intangibles and the type of player and worker he is. Um, but I also could see some teams being like, Ooh, we, I don't know, but unbelievable year he had and you know the the background seems good and um if you're getting an efficient combo guard that's tough um i understand it especially this class because it might just be one of those high floor like hey he's he's gonna play for us for a very long time those guys you need in playoff series to to really pack a punch so i get it um i'm trying to think of a name for you that's kind of a little out there uh I like him a lot. I think Nikola Topic is becoming the wild card. Um because he's was it mis- you guys was it you guys that said he had a really long neck? And I was like oh, gosh, who was that? <laughs> I was like, someone mentioned that and I was like, you know what? Is he actually Maybe. six five with a long neck? <laughs> I I, yeah, it might be. Little... That's probably someone that our team has said that. If not, that's an amazing comment. He I, I've heard he's around six six. Um it's okay. a good good size six 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 seven um obviously the combine will be the the final judge of all of that stuff but topich is he looked fantastic when he was playing with mega this year transferred to play for red star played a couple games got hurt he's we're still Mm -hmm. waiting for him to return at this point i'm like okay are you gonna return i know he's been cleared really gifted playmaker really really gifted with good size um the shot kind of also keeps me in question but I think he's just gifted a, a high feel guy that if you're looking for a playmaker, I get it. Absolutely. There's some defensive questions. Um, there's some, like I just said, there's some questions about the shot. So I, I think he's an interesting one that if he doesn't come back, if he doesn't play the pre-draft's going to be kind of a little interesting thing to keep him, keep an eye on the the buzz because if he's on the board for Utah, like maybe that makes sense of like, okay, you get him and then Keontae, they can kind of play together with good size. Like there's a lot of headaches, James, in this class. Like we're yeah. trying to, oh, we're trying I'm to glad figure I'm out like, GM. <laughs> no, we're just trying, we're trying to figure out like the fits and you get to each team this year and you're like, well, three or four guys make sense here. So it's, it's going to be crazy next couple of months. Yeah. I think Utah, I don't know if they'd love, I mean, I think they, we saw a lot from Keontae George this year and yeah and and I think he's gonna for sure be on the jazz as a guard for a long time now. Whether he plays off the ball, I I know Utah wants size and so maybe a topich kind of fits, but then you ask yourself, well, then did we just waste a pick on Keontae if he's playing out of position? I don't know. So I don't it's love be- it. I don't love it. So I, I'm right there with you. I think me and you are on the same page. I don't love it. I love more of like a castle with him. That makes sense mm-hmm. to me, but um that, that's why this year is going to be crazy because of fit. Cause it's like, well, I don't love that, but you know, teams might see things con- completely differently. Okay. Well, and I want to, and before I just, I want to get to the 2025 here quick, mm-hmm. but what about Zach? It's Zachary Reza Isn't that how you say yes. that? Um, yes. What are your thoughts on him? I know he kind of tapered off at the end, um, but a lot of people have him like really high. And what are your thoughts on him? Uh, yeah, he, he was, He's been a so I I saw him last year in person at Nike Hoop Summit. So this has been like a full journey for me. Um, and there when I saw him, he looked very timid just throughout practices through the week. Just timid, trying to kind of find his groove. Just didn't look that confident. Um, looked good in the game. He played and looked good. And then he went overseas, was playing for a new team the mindset looks like completely different. He was very aggressive, very confident, kind of attacking and dunking on people. I was like, where's this been for the last, you know, couple summers Hmm. and long season 
for them, which, you know, I'm not trying to make excuses, but he shot the crap out of the ball this year. And it was like, is this real? Because this is crazy numbers. Like it was mid forties to fifties from downtown all year. It was like, okay, is this a, a legit thing? Or are you just having a fantastic year? And then it's, it's cooled off a little bit, but long season. Um, I think they played like 60 games or something. So I, I'm one of those evaluators like I'm taking the whole season into consideration I there's always a rough stretch there's always a really impressive stretch so I I still think Risha Shea is gonna have some fans I still think people are gonna be playing intrigued there was a time in the beginning of the year where everyone's like he might be the number one guy over Sar there's mm -hmm. still some people that feel that way I, I'm not there um I've asked around people are like I still like him the number one talk is not there anymore, but I still like him maybe like somewhere in the top 10. So he's, he's an interesting one. Um, as for a team like Utah, he could be a really interesting piece because of his size. He's really smart defensively, um, a good team defender, good on ball defender. And if you're buying the shot, then you get a, a good three and D player with a, with a high floor potentially, but pre-draft workouts going to be really important for him. So he can go in there and be like, okay, you know, the 20% I'm shooting of lately is, is a fluke and I can really shoot it. So it's going to be interesting with him because he's had a complete roller coaster of a year when it comes to just like, whoa, you, you were in the number one talk and now you're cooling down. Like, where's it going to be? So yeah, one of those names I'm, I'm fascinated to monitor kind of in the upcoming months. Awesome. Let's see. Now I want to ask you about 2025. And so you're familiar with Danny Ainge. Uh, he's talking about the Jazz. Every, anything is possible this offseason. Although, in my opinion, if you just look at the Jazz draft situation, what they did the, to end this season. Un, basically, Danny Ainge in his final comments of the season said, unless we get uh, they're going big game hunting was his big uh, his big comment. But they aren't going to make a trade that takes them from like the 23rd best team to like the 18th best team. So unless they're going out there and getting an absolute franchise changer, like Luka Doncic, or maybe Giannis, if the, if the, if the bucks lose in the first round, maybe he wants to go somewhere and Utah throws a big, you know, unless something like that happens, I think the jazz are going to go the other direction. We're probably going to see Larry Markin and get moved at some point. Um, it's going to be a fascinating offseason regardless for Utah, but I think they're going to be in the top 10. So for me, Cooper Flag is just someone I've been watching all year. Um, I, obviously, I didn't get to go to Hoop Summit. I, I'm so jealous of you guys go to Hoop Summit. And like, I just, I, it's like, uh, that would be so cool. I guess, do you want to tell, talk to everyone about, you know, Cooper Flag, Ace Bailey? I mean, Dylan Hall Harper, who are the guys that you've seen that you were really impressed by and just thoughts on hoop summit and everything else you've seen so far? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of guys that looked really, really good. Um, I think Cooper's going to be, he, he's, he's worth the hype. Um, I would say this about Cooper. I think Cooper's going to be the defensive versatility, like jumbo connector, just like he's going to be the piece of the puzzle that, gets the whole picture together. I think he's got a while before he's going to be this, you know, 20 point per game guy. I, I don't see that route, but he might be a 15, 10, four and three, like just he, he's versatility. He impacts games, super competitive. Um, one of the scrimmages we, we watched before the game, you know, he's picking up guys full court the whole time. Like he, and he, as the game got longer, he got stronger because he was just constantly coming after people and battling. So he's competitive. He, he's a leader. He's talking on the court. I, I was very impressed. Ace Bailey is the, is the upside swing with that class. Like everyone's going to love Cooper flag, but Ace Bailey is one of those. If the pieces come together, everyone buckle up. Like, whew. you know, it didn't take long before I was like, Oh my goodness. This kid has the tools to be something dangerous. He's huge. I mean, he's listed at six nine, but I was like, he's humongous. And um, what I what I was most impressed by Ace Bailey was he was talking nonstop. He's he's helping. He's talking with his team. He's trying to bark out like defensive commands in between possessions. You know, when the ball goes out of bounds, they're talking about like, hey, you should be here. I should be here. And in drills, he was just constantly firing people up. And then 
you know, he's humongous with this skinny frame, but the tools are just fantastic. So it, he's going to need to figure out, you know, everyone's, some people were like, yeah, the shot selection. I'm like, okay, well, he was pulling up from about five feet beyond the arc and swishing a lot of shots too. So I'm okay <laughs> with that. So it's just, he's going to be the upside swing. If things come together, it can be really dangerous. Dylan Harper's just damn good. He's just a really good player. So you get him, um, VJ Edgecombe that's going to Baylor, looked nasty, um, kind of an athletic wing with crazy athleticism, but he 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 really impressed. There's a lot of guys. Like it, it's we were kind of like kids at the candy store, you know, watching <laughs> those practices, and we're like, oh my goodness, this is okay, this is what the draft class is supposed to look like. So it it's gonna be a fun year. I mean people are going to make a lot of, okay, it's time to tank jokes. You know, it's just going to be really fun in college basketball. Oh man. Yeah. VJ Ed's call He's the one that I'm kind of interested in. So what did you see from him? Cause I I've heard just, he's super athletic. He's got pretty good size. Is he, I mean, honestly, and he's going four in this draft there. It's crazy. This draft actually, what well, just, I guess, what did you see from him? What was he doing that made you like him so much? I'm trying. I feel like I'm even missing another name. Like th that's how exciting the whole process was. So well, I'm trying I'm, to get my, my database up too. Um, yeah, I'm looking at Hugo Gonzalez. Oh, uh, Hugo's Galil fine. Bethia. Yep. Yeah, just talk about all these guys. <laughs> Hugo's fun. I, I, I. When was it? I feel like a, a year ago we were doing a FIBA video breakdown on on no ceilings and um, and Hugo's just woo. He's just very very fun. Can get easily. Spanish guard that could get a little nasty and dunk on people. He's he's competitive. He's got some fire. Like he's going to be the the top international guy in my opinion to watch. Um, VJ's just we got there, and you know I, when I'm watching the first kind of practices or scrimmages, I'm just trying to be like, okay, who pops to me? And then I'm looking down at my roster and being like, okay, yep, that checks out. And he came in the first scrimmage, and I was like, who the hell is that? Like I was just like that that dude's built for you know he just a ball of muscle and i looked down i was like that's vj you know and i watched i'd watched him previously but just seeing in person is a completely different world and he had a play that it was like the worst alley-oop pass of all time and he like <laughs> caught it with his left hand brought it back and threw it down right hand and the whole gym just looked around like what did we just oh, see yeah he just was sitting in the air and then there's some defensive stuff competitive um there was some on-ball stuff where I was like, this kid might be a potential another one in this class. Like, he might be that guy. So I, you just heard some good things, too, about his mentality, and I think it showed on the court. So he's one of those, like, I think there was a lot of big names that everyone was getting excited about, and I left that saying, VJ might be in that conversation, too. And I'm not saying, like, oh, he's going to get up to top two, but I'm saying he might be one of those, like, oh, you get him at five or six, you might be really excited about that even if you're not getting Cooper flag. So there's a lot of really good talent. There's a lot of really good um, names to keep an eye on. Well, that's why if I'm Utah, if I can just get a bottom five pick, I'm getting someone really nice and someone to build around. And then 2026 looks awesome as well. Uh, what do you, what do you know about Cam? It's Cam and Malawatch. I think he's the prospect from, from Africa. And some of the film is kind of eye popping. Like, Holy cow. He's it, a big was boy. he at Hoop Summit? Yes, he, he's going to Duke. Um, he's a big boy. He was one of those, like, oh, gosh. Like, um, Ulrich Chomps is a big that's – he entered his name this year. Everyone's a little intrigued by him as, like, the late second round. And then um, he was standing next to him, and you're like, you know, Ulrich looks like a midget compared to him. He's just a big <laughs> boy. And he, he had some plays that were very impressive, some blocks, some dunks, and – He's just a lumbering giant. So, like, it, I left that saying, like, okay, I want to see what this looks like in a couple months because it's just a it's just a huge body. And I think when people get people get frustrated, and I always have to remind myself as an evaluator, is the bigs are funky. They it takes time for them to kind of everything click together, and um, they're always the really exciting ones because you're just like, look how big they are, and they can run, and like. They can dunk easily. And I think it's everything kind of takes a while for it to get on the same page. So he's just one of those, like, I was like, all right, I get where you're at right now. Let's see where you're at when 
preseason college basketball starts. Let's see how you progress. But very big, um, lengthy, had some couple blocks. You're just like, oh, my. But want to see if the the feet and the hands can kind of develop a little bit more. But it's also tough when you're seven one, seven two, and built like that. Like, yeah, you're probably not going to be dancing around like a ballerina. So, I mean, it, we'll, we'll see how he develops. But another guy, like, to keep an eye on. I, I'm guessing you guys, I, maybe you can't, your team can go, but I am, I figure that uh, Rutgers and Duke next year when they meet up oh, yeah. is going to be the game to go see. Because I, you know, Dylan Harper, Ace Bailey, or Rutgers, that's going to be a blast. And then, and yeah, I guess Malawatch with Cooper Flag. I mean, that's a big team. <laughs> so it'll be- yeah, I mean, we're, we're already circling games. Um, we got someone in New York, um, Corey and Tullaba and he's already been like I'm going to every records game I could possibly go to so I mean there's that I, I'm in Phoenix so Duke's playing um Arizona this year and I'm like I'm going to that you know I'm gonna try to find a way to get to that or it's just it's gonna be a very exciting year to start circling some games and being like I'm not missing those um very talented class so that's why if you're Utah yeah this is it, the one fans should be excited well um I appreciate it, Tyler. Again, everyone, make sure you go file, file, um, follow Tyler on Twitter. Uh, follow No Ceilings on... I subscribe to your guys' newsletter. I go to their YouTube channel. You guys do great content there. Make sure you're going there. I'll try to put a link in the in the description. Anything else I'm missing that you want to pitch to the listeners, viewers? No, I, I mean, No Ceilings NBA on all socials. Um, we'll have a draft guide coming out that everyone should be pretty pumped about. And then, you know, we we're already looking forward to next year. We usually do a preseason draft guide, which I'm sure will be popular with a lot of folks for, for next year's class. So no, I appreciate it, James. Thank you for having me on. And you know, it's going to be a fun, fun uh, off season, especially for jazz fans. You bet. We'll have to do this again. Hey, thanks Tyler. Absolutely.